Okay, so it started recording. Okay. Have to click the gun. It's not on her screen. Oh, oh yes. Okay. See that? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Uh, we are very pleased with uh, with Jordan to be uh, to be here this week uh, in San Francisco. Uh, so, actually, we are finishing a long week of presentation uh, everywhere. Uh, so, on Monday we were at Google. In the afternoon we watched uh, Pascal, our CTO, uh, present uh, the company at the RSA Innovation Contest. So, unfortunately, as you can see, I'm not. With any kind of uh, trophy. <laughs> so, yes, we were um, quite good, but we didn't win. Uh, then on Tuesday, we were on stage with, uh, with Jordan uh, at the AI and ML uh, track. And, uh, and, and now we, we are uh, well with you guys. Uh, so, we are very happy, a bit tired. Uh, Jordan is very tired, uh, but you will find the energy to. Uh, yes, and you know, we are, you know, we also have the jet lag uh, from France and so on. But we are going to present you what we are doing at Zama, uh, which is, I think, it's uh, quite exciting. Uh, and we are very happy to be there to present this because uh, we know that, uh, I mean, uh, Stanford is the cradle of uh, FHE, so yeah. it's amazing. Um, and that's it. Um, okay, so what Zama is. So Zama is a startup in France, I mean, mainly in France. We are a bit also in Europe. Uh, we are about 70 people, uh, maybe 60% of us are PhDs. Uh, so PhD mainly in crypto, but also some PhDs in, uh, in uh, machine learning and in, um, and in, uh, in, in compiler, for example. Um, so our uh, two founders, uh, so Rand, uh, is an entrepreneur. So he made a few companies and he sold his last one, uh, which was already about privacy. And uh, so we have Pascal. Uh, so if, I don't know who you are exactly, but of course, the cryptographer <laughs> in the room, Pascal is quite uh, well known for, uh, for homomorphic things for quite a long oh, time. Or sure you Yes. yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I was not, uh, you know, I didn't want to. Say it was in the, in the late 90s. So yes. We've yeah. come such a long way. <laughs> uh, so everything we do at, uh, at Zama is open source. So if you want to try something, it's doable, especially for students, researchers, it's free. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, yeah, we are going to, to go into the details, but mainly, you know what it is. We are using a TFHE. Um, Okay, so uh, machine learning is everywhere, as you know. Uh, if you want to classify your emails uh, to detect spam, if uh, you want to have uh, uh, health uh, data uh, analysis, uh, if you want to, uh, for your voice recognition, it's everywhere. Uh, but, but obviously, no one wants to have uh, this uh, in the clear, no one wants to have this mail or to have this health data available to third parties that they don't trust. So, what we are doing at Zama, and especially in the team, is to allow the, the users to have the same kind of service, uh, but in a way which is privacy preserving. Uh, so privacy preserving machine learning is what we are doing in the team. Uh, more generally, uh, in Zama, uh, it's uh, about what you can do with the FHE. Uh, so if ever you have questions, by the way, uh, we'll handle them. And for the good questions, so, uh, Dan uh, proposed me that to give the caps for the good questions. <laughs> As you can see, they are very nice. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty more questions, so you can be very proud of it if you walk uh, there. Uh, so if I were you, I would prepare some questions. Um, okay. Uh, so the agenda, I'm not going to go into the details. You are going to discover all of this. So what FHE is, so sorry if I say something which is obvious to you. Uh, maybe there are uh, some of some of you in the audience who are not aware of this, so I'm going to take a bit too much maybe for you. Uh, so fully homomorphic is uh, the big thing that we are working on at Zama. Uh, everything we do is at Zama is based on this. Uh, so we are, uh, so for some products, it's uh, for fully homomorphic encryption for machine learning, so our product. Uh, or on the other side, there is also FHT for uh, blockchain or, or this kind of things. Um, so if you look a bit how uh, machine learning is when uh, you run this uh, in the cloud, it's something like that. 
Uh, so you have some client and the server. Uh, the server is going to run the machine learning algorithm, um, and the client has the, the data. So the data is X, so may, maybe it's a, a data that you don't want to share. But what you do is you encrypt it during the transport, you send it to the server, which is going to decrypt it because it, it has the same keys and, and you. Uh, and then the computation of the F function is uh, done in the clear. Uh, and uh, just for the transport, so when you send it back to the client, uh, it is also encrypted. Um, but as you can see here, the server knows everything. Uh, it knows uh, your data and it knows uh, the result of the uh, computation. So that's not what something that we want to have. It's not a good property. So what we are doing at Zama uh, is to try to have something which looks like this. Um, so here, uh, you also have the data. You are encrypting it uh, with a key, but the big difference is that this key is not known to the server. So the server will never be able to decrypt anything. Uh, it will just have the encryption of X. Uh, and then, the, but, but thanks to some mathematical properties that we are going to describe just after, or that you will know, uh, we are able to turn the the function f, the machine learning model, or actually any function, into an FHC equivalent, uh, which will be able to take input, uh, encrypted inputs, which will have some um, information to run the computation, so public information. And uh, at the end, the result will be uh, f of x, but uh, encrypted. And never uh, any intermediate value or the inputs or the output will be uh, decrypted because actually the server uh, doesn't know the key. And then you send this result back, and uh, that's the only moment um, with the key, which is uh, only on the client side, uh, where uh, you can uh, decrypt things. So at the end, you have f of x, which is what you want it to be uh, compute, but never things have been uh, interpreted. Okay, so for people who don't know FHC, it looks a bit too magical. Uh, so let me show you this in practice. Um, so um, again, face. Um, so again, face. If you if you don't know, again, face is a kind of GitHub for machine learning. So it's a bit the, where people want to show things uh, when they want to make a demos of uh, machine learning stuff. So we, we have uh, created our own space on again face and we are uh, publishing some demos of what you can do with Google uh, So this one is an encrypted image uh, filtering. Uh, there was another one. Uh, if you want to run this, it's also uh, possible. I mean, it's uh, publicly accessible. Um, and let me show you what this demo is about. Um, so it's more or less what we have shown in the previous slide. So you have uh, the client, which who has uh, some uh, private images that he doesn't want to share. So what it does is that it encrypts this image. Uh, then the image, uh, it's an encryption. So the image is going to be random looking. Uh, but still, thanks to the mathematical property, it's possible to apply the filter on the, on the encrypted image. Uh, so then you, you will have the other random looking image on the right. And uh, so this has been uh, computed on the server. And then you send it back to the client uh, who can, uh, with his uh, private key, decrypt uh, all of this. Um, so if you look, so sorry, I, I, did, I did it this, uh, this morning. So let me refresh. OK, so when you want the demo, you have to choose uh, one of the images. So let's take the, the cat. Uh, but you could drop your own image if you want. Uh, then there, there are some uh, filters. Um, so in the example uh, above, it was uh, black and white. Uh, you have a bunch of uh, filters that you can apply. Uh, so let's take inverted. Um, then you generate the key, which is going to stay on the client side, um, except for the public key material that you send to the server. Uh, then you encrypt the image. Uh, you send it to the server. Um, then you run the FHT execution. Uh, so basically, uh, filtering is just a convolution. So it's something which is uh, not very complicated to uh, compute. And um, 
and then you you, you send it back to the, to the client and so you have uh, the output which is uh, yeah random looking and uh, you can decrypt and uh, you can recognize the cat but uh, the colors have been inverted yes so i noticed that the uh, you have the identity in there does that mean the uh, server side will know that it's produced the same output as it comes in i have not understood this question so because of its identity right yes. is, oh you mean uh, the identity filter, filter. I, I don't know what so i don't yeah. know so, 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 so the that server that will know that the, the server knows every the time what the function is yeah. right and so the function the function yeah. is so yes the function that we are computing is not protected yeah so no so what i'm wondering is could there be a function that just by chance produced the same output for a particular input and would that leak information it, it, it would not leak information because the result is still encrypted but it's identical to the input if it happens it's, it's to, not going to be from the cycle so that's, just, that's my question. question yeah that was my question yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the encryption is semantically secure, meaning yes. that you can like encrypt yeah, no, the same just, thing twice. So you wouldn't, I just you wouldn't wanted, be able to tell them apart. So actually, just, just thinking of a general algorithm sure. that I, by chance, put into parameters that produce an identity transformation. Mm -hmm. And then the server question was would the server know that that had happened? Mm -hmm. And that's a leak of one bit, maybe. But I mean, what is computed by the server can be computed by anyone because there is nothing private. Yeah. So it would mean this would be an attack against uh, the original ciphertext, which is uh, proven secure by uh, the yeah, yeah. Okay. Fine. You, you could ju just uh, yeah, sorry. you could consider trying to protect the confidentiality of the function that is being yeah, evaluated else, on yeah. the server side. Yeah. Uh, but this is not something that we support yeah, technologically yet. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people are also wondering. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that wasn't the question. And FHE can do that, by the yeah. way. You okay. can do something. Okay, that wasn't the question. No. Um, okay, so you have seen it in practice. Now, how does it work? Um, so actually, FHE is, um, is this magical weapon that I, I'm going to explain. So the important word here is uh, homomorphic. So here it means that there is some kind of uh, malleability for the ciphertext. So notably, when you have uh, an encryption of X, an encryption of Y, it's possible thanks uh, only with the public key information to compute uh, an encryption of X plus Y. Same thing, uh, it's possible to multiply a ciphertext by a constant that, uh, which is in, in the clear. Uh, and, and then there is a third operator, uh, which is a uh, unique to TFHE, which is a scheme that we are using at Zama. Um, which is uh, the programmable bootstrapping. And so programmable bootstrapping uh, is uh, the equivalent of table lookup, but in FHE, which means that um, at compilation time, you have chosen the function of your choice at T, uh, which is a constant, and uh, you can apply this table lookup uh, on an encrypted value and uh, directly get uh, some uh, T of X. Uh, so we are going to see this is a magical weapon which is used in concrete ML, uh, and uh, let's say in uh, all the, the tools that we are doing at Zama, um, it allows us to replace anything which is not naturally FHE friendly. Um, okay, so now, now that, that we've seen the few operators which are doable in FHE, let's have a look to what it gives us for uh, machine learning. Um, so if we have to divide the operations in a machine learning, uh, we can more or less have two categories. So the first one is for the operators, which are more or less additions or add, uh, of uh, additive uh, nature. Uh, so here you have the convolution, the matrix multiplication, and so on. So here, more or less, uh, it just directly applies the same operation on, on ciphertext, and it will work uh, thanks to the homomorphic properties. For nonlinear uh, layers like uh, activation, it's uh, another thing. And uh, so, what we are doing at Zama is that we are, we are replacing these operations by the table lookup, so the PBS, programmable bootstrapping in, uh, in, in FHE. Uh, so, you just have to, uh, let's say, um, when you compile the program, you have to, to compute or to measure the range of the inputs so that you can uh, you know the range of the input of these activation functions. So you can pre-compute the table lookup corresponding to this range of inputs. 
and you just replace the activation function by the basis event. You tell me huh, if you want to, if you have questions, uh, that are still uh, kept to me. So I'm, I'm interested in the performance. Yes, we are going to okay. go to this okay. subject. Okay. Yes. So at the end, uh, we have taken our uh, machine learning uh, model and uh, we have replaced it by something which looks, which looks uh, like this. So you have the linear operations, uh, which, uh, so which are the stigma, uh, which are the same uh, linear operations uh, on over encrypted data. And then you also have the activation functions, like the low value or so, that you have replaced by the PDS. So it's possible more or less to replace not all, but really most of the machine learning models. And uh, it's just a matter of, yes, so of performances. So PBS is uh, great, but it's uh, not free. Uh, so if you can, you try to have uh, less PBS or maybe a PBS of a smaller size. So you are going to see this uh, when uh, uh, Jordan speaks about uh, trees, for example. Yes? Go ahead. Um, I noticed in the previous slide for the programmable bootstrapping, the secret key changes from SK1 to SK2. Yes. So for every PPS or for every table lookup, will the client have to generate you know, that many key pairs? Uh, how does that work? So it's, it's, it's a re entrant. It's, it's it, so it's re entrant. Whenever you do a PBS, so actually the PBS is composed of uh, several ingredients. So you go through like a key switching operation, and then you go through a what we call the blind rotation, which is a bit like specific to uh, TFHG and and <clears throat> and, uh, and other schemes like few and schemes that use like uh, like a line rotation, well multiplication of a polynomial by by a, a simple monomial. Um, so when you do the key switch operation, you're actually switching from SK1 to SK2. Mm -hmm. And then with the blind rotation, you are actually going from SK2 to SK3, but you make it re-entrant, meaning that SK3 is actually SK1. So you call PBS the whole thing, and then you're encrypted with the same parameters, both at the input and output. So you use the same eval key throughout the process. Yes. Okay. So you can you can do everything with like one unique key switching key, one unique uh, line rotation key. But you could also you're not forced to do that. I mean, this is what we're doing right now because it suits you know machine learning models. It's, it's, it's very easy. You know, there's linear layers and then you have these activation layers, and so it makes sense to do things like that for machine learning. But for other applications, if you want to like handcraft specific circuits. You could play around and, and not force the PBS to be re entered You have like a chain of, of keys, and it's up to you to, to find like the optimal parameterization so that you can save the funds. This is assuming circular security? Uh, yeah. yeah, at some point we need uh, these kind of solutions. Yes. And, and so this, this depends on the, the limited precision needed for, uh, for machine learning. Yes. yes. So yes, we are going to speak about it in more details. But actually, before you, there's one important point that I think you should say just to make sure it's clear to everybody. Like in the demo that you gave about inverting an image. Yes. I could have just inverted on my phone. I didn't have to send it to the oh, server. Oh yes. Yes. yes, for sure. In here, uh, the server could just send the model to the phone. Yes. And the phone could just evaluate the model itself. Yes. There's no need for FHG. Yes. So where, yes. where maybe you could just say where does FHG come up? So for example, if ever you, you want to protect the IP of your model and you don't want to share it on the device because I don't know, maybe you are Microsoft and the device is an iPhone. You don't want to share it. So you can run it on your own uh, server and uh, by keep, uh, keeping the privacy of the user. So uh, both of them are happy. They just have to wait a bit uh, longer. But I'm not going to let you have to hook that. Either. Yeah. <laughs> that as a malicious user, I yes. just send you a bunch of data, see yes. how your model works on that data. Yeah, sure. And then I will just extract your model yes. from yes. the server. So, or so, more yes. directly. Just, so yeah. actually, yeah. actually, all the machine learning uh, attacks that you have in the clear, I mean, FHG is not protecting against it. Uh, so what you have in the clear, it exists in FHG. Yeah. Uh, if it, the other use case, though, is if you and I both need to provide some input, we don't want to reveal it. 
Yes. Yeah, but under repeated yeah, allocation, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, with FHE is not going to protect against that kind of thing. And, um, and also what, okay, what we are presenting here is for the ML case, but it's um, what we are doing at Zama is more general. So notably we are working on something which is called concrete Python, uh, which allows you to turn any Python program uh, into the FHE equivalent, where maybe you don't have that kind of uh, problems. Yeah. You happy with me, question? Yeah, they're very, very happy. Okay. Oh, no. So you have, you have, you have, you have the first. Uh, Great. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, a follow-up question. Um, yes. You, even more directly, does the FHA team that you guys are building on provide function privacy? Function yeah. privacy? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Not, 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 not evenly, but we can build function privacy. Sure. I'm okay. talking about it. That's not something you're doing, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, we're not working on this because this is not like the most urgent, of course, problem to crash. But we know we can we can we can get there. We can go there at some point. Yeah. So function is privacy is when you want to obfuscate the function, the function definition. Yeah, the, the server itself will know the function. Okay, yes. It's, so yes, it's, it's doable. Yeah. So it's doable. So for example, one thing which is quite easy to do is to also encrypt the weights. So it's, you don't uh, protect the, the backbone itself, so the, the structure, but, but you protect the weights. Uh -huh. But it would make uh, FHE inferences a much slower. Sorry, maybe you're correct. That's actually, that, that is interesting. Well, that's not what I meant to ask about. What I meant to yeah, ask is there. Sure. Okay, but the answer to that is also no. But yes, yeah, yes, yeah, absolutely. No, but I mean, if we're, in the end, all the computation has to be reduced to what's yeah. the input. So you're kind of forced to use the circuit like representation of your function. Uh, and so you can have like because you could have like a universal circuit, yeah, and then provide an encrypted circuit as an input together with uh, input coming from the user. Mm -hmm. okay. You could always restrict that, but yeah. of course there should be like better ways, like more clever ways to yeah. other kind of shortcuts that like say performance. Yeah, something. Sure. Okay. Um, so now, so. As you can see, as you can imagine, it's, this is a bit complicated to do that by hand. So we have explained you how to do this, but you don't want to do it by hand. So we've done a project to do this uh, for the users. So our users are actually data scientists. Uh, and notably, we, uh, okay, I will, I will say it uh, just after, but so what we are um, focused on for the moment is the inference. So we are protecting the inference. We are protecting the data of the users. Um, and we also give some uh, functions to deploy this if ever you want to go in production or, or build uh, your own company around it. Uh, and notably, we are not uh, working on a training for the moment, continental training. Uh, so it's in the roadmap, but we have to choose a bit what we work on. Uh, but it's also possible in FHE to do some training. It will also be quite uh, long, um, but it's uh, doable. Uh, so, yes. Sorry to say this, uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, we, uh, I mean, uh, we want to make a product which is easy to use uh, for the users, and the users are data scientists. So we want them to, we want to blind the them the, the crypto for them. We don't want them to make mistakes. Uh, they shouldn't know what the PBS key or whatever. Um, so more or less, we just tell them this is encrypted, uh, and that's it. Uh, so it will uh, go into the details of the API, but you will see that it's quite easy. Uh, also, it's not possible for the user uh, to reduce the security parameters. Obviously, they, if they don't know, they would say <laughs> it is going. It is, it is much faster if I said just a little bit of security. We don't let uh, them uh, do that kind of mistakes. Um, also, so uh, our users they are very familiar with Torch, with Scikit-Learn, with the OneNX and uh, Car TensorFlow. So we have made APIs which are very close to them. Uh, so if you have already done machine learning in the past, you are already able to use concrete ML. And I'm not lying, so you will try and you will see this. Uh, so we, we uh, release uh, the, the APIs that we have are uh, the same ones. And for example, even for the feed, we are using the, the feed of the uh, feed. And my last slide before I let uh, Jordan. Uh, so we have divided in concrete ML, we have divided the models into three categories. Uh, so there is the linear model category, uh, which is the easy one. So it's a filter uh, imaging that you have seen. So it's not really machine learning, but it's something which is linear. So same thing for machine learning, you have linear regression, regression, and so on. 
This is very easy to do in the uh, FHE. There is no PBS, so it is very fast. It is very precise. Um, go on. Then you have the tree-based uh, models. So one of the LS to check with. So it's uh, another story. It's a bit more complicated. Uh, there are some PBS there, so things that will be a bit slower. Uh, so it's not that slow. It's a matter of seconds, maybe, uh, which is much slower than in the clear, but it's uh, okay. And then the last cat category, so it depends really a lot uh, on uh, about your um, uh, data set. But if you are classifying something with a big data set, this is going to be a very long uh, in, uh, in FH. Um, and now Jordan will explain you the details. Great. So, yeah, so I'm from the machine learning side. So I'm going to be maybe quicker than I usually do here. Uh, so when I joined them, uh, I've basically been told what you've heard. Uh, FH can essentially do anything, so it should be easy to adapt to machine learning. There are a few constraints that come with FHG, and uh, I'm going to basically present that and show you basically how it works uh, in the industry. And the first thing that the scheme we use implies is that machine learning algorithms, they need to work with uh, integers. So every single parameter in the model must be an integer. And the operations, they must work all on integers. So we, are, we basically have to map the floating point world to the integer world and make the model um, keep the same accuracy. So there is a, um, a domain which is uh, taking up right now because of all these craziness about large language models. It's called quantization. So essentially now, because we have billions parameters models, people want to cut the cost of running those models, but they also want to run these models on standard hardware. So what happens is that if you take this uh, picture of a dog, a picture, every single pixel is represented with 256 values per channel, so RGB. What you can do is decrease the number of value available in the picture uh, down to four or three bits, and it takes uh, quite some effort from your human eyes to see that there is a difference with the eight bits, right? So actually people realize that machine learning models, they don't really need 32 bits for two points. And you can essentially just decrease the precision quite a lot and the machine learning model can still behave properly regarding the accuracy. So that's a great part. In concrete, so a year and a few months ago, we had like six or seven bits of precision. Today, we are at 16 bits of precision, meaning that we cannot go over that threshold. That's the purple limit for now. For when there is a PDS in the circuit. So now let's look at um, so the API, and I'm going to explain a bit like what are the specificities of these models. Actually, just to be clear, so when you say 16 bits, you mean that there's a, a wraparound if you go beyond? So if you add three 15-bit numbers, you'll, you'll, you'll wrap around? So I'm not sure it's a regular overflow. I think it's a negative. Right yeah, it's I'm a saturated, isn't it? Yeah. It's not saturated. Not saturated. It's not saturated. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an overflow. But uh, actually, it's a compiler. So what we are doing, uh, what you are using below, it's undefined. So you are not supposed to overflow. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so it's it's for real. because there are different kinds of PDS. Yeah. One with a, a bit of padding, <coughs> one without. So you don't know what kind of PDS you're going to use. And uh, if ever there is a bit of padding and you override it, you are yeah. going to have troubles. So uh -huh. it, it depends where you're overflowing in the circuit. Okay. But if you do that when you are just uh, doing like the linear stuff, yeah, it's it's a wraparound. Because everything we do is like modular power of two. So in the end, you're just like wrapping things around. But if you do that as in other part of the circuit, that's why we kind of force the fact that it's like undefined because it's very hard to predict what's going to happen. So when we compile, we make sure that this never happens. And this is all the art of homomorphic computation, making sure that you're always, you're never losing the consistency of what you're computing. Uh -huh. So when you go to undefined, when you decrypt, you'll actually get undefined. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, well, essentially, in machine learning, you expect your you know production environment to be distributed similarly at your training data set. Hopefully, this is what happens. Uh, and basically, any theory, machine learning theory, wouldn't really stand a chance if you don't assume that. So, yeah. So here, it's basically an API to call the gradient boosting. So it's essentially an ensemble of trees, uh, lots of trees in there. Uh, you can basically use, if you have used scikit-learn before, this is very similar. The, num the only thing that you have to do here is to set the number of bits. So you have to basically say, now my input is over eight bits. Uh, and this number of bits is going to be important later. So here you have uh, the predict function, so you can test what happens. But you can, once you're happy, you can actually send the whole model that you trained and compile it to the AKG equivalent. And here, the, the, the X train that you pass in the compiling is basically going to be below the ranges uh, for the precision in your circuit uh, that you don't want to. Uh, is 10 bits a power of two or an arbitrary value less than 60? This is, and bits is going to be like two to the power of eight. Right? Oh, two to the power oh, yeah, it's, yeah. So yeah, this yeah. is the X one. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so here you're allowing the input to have 256. Okay, right. Per feature. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, once you have compiled, you can basically uh, rebuild this simulation because uh, if you are benchmarking your model, maybe you don't want to pay the cost of FHG here. Uh, but once you are happy with that, uh, with the simulation, you should go into FHG, check the time, execution time, and the results are going to be exactly the same as the simulation. So this number of bits is quite important here because it's going to be the trade-off between accuracy and execution time in FHG. So basically, uh, on the left uh, figure, you can see that we start with a bit width of one, just one bit of precision. Random is pretty much random. Uh, the model is pretty much random here uh, because it doesn't have, the input doesn't have enough expressiveness to the degree that you uh, But if you go to, uh, like, for example, here up to six bits here, you achieve like 99% uh, match with the focal point model. If you look at the right shot now, uh, up to six bits, you are below the two second mark. So the whole model, so here it's like 50 trees with a depth of three, and the whole model ran in FHG under the two second mark. If you want more input, uh, more bits here, uh, you can go all the way up 16, but you can see that execution time uh, is going to increase uh, quite a lot. Is, is the algorithm parallelizable? It is, it is. So here we are talking about a tree. A tree is massively uh, parallelizable. You can basically, so you have basically two step of PBSs. So you can distribute everything uh, uh, and you have basically only two steps to do. Um, so you are. And these, so about trees here. So we have a white paper where we explain how we do it, but essentially trees, you can't uh, do the standard uh, tree traversal, right? The other condition, if the condition is match, you go right. If the condition isn't match, you go left. This is not something you can do in FHG, right? You don't know what's the encrypted inputs and you don't know what's the result of the condition, uh, right? So what we do is to transform the tree traversal into a series of matrix multiplications. And what this implies is that you have to execute all the condition from all the trees in your ensemble uh, to actually know what's the answer, what the result. So now comes the linear models. So as Bruno mentioned, those are pretty um, easy to, to, to run. They are super fast and you can set more number, more bits than in any other model because there is no PDS. And yeah, some visualization. So here are two random data set. You can see the floating point model on the middle. Uh, and on the right, you can see the, the concrete ML uh, linear model, which is a logistic regression here. Um, so it's essentially equivalent in terms of accuracy. And you can see some artifacts which come from the fact that we are now using quantization and the model cannot predict outside the boundaries you gave in the training. Great. 
So the two models I presented, they are pretty uh, fast, let's say, in FHE. Linear super fast, three days around the second, and uh, they are as accurate as the body points. Now comes the deploying part. Actually, can I ask about the trees? Yeah. So if I understand correctly, the, the numbers you showed was for trees of depth uh, three? Yeah. So yeah you, like what's um, so trees when they're used in practice for data science? How 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 big are how deep are they? Yeah, so for so here it's a XG boost, so it's a gradient boosting uh, classifier. And in these ensemble, trees are very uh, are not deep at all. Mm -hmm. you, you need small trees, but a lot of them, 50, uh -huh. 100, right? On, on the like random forest on the country, like they are, they need to be very deep. Mm -hmm. And you need also a lot of trees. A random forest, uh, you would pay more, like basically in FHE, you wouldn't use random forest. Oh. Because they are super costly compared to gradient boosting, which achieve and gradient boosting has been proven to be like the reference in terms of machine learning based on trees. So you could use uh, gradient boosting. Yeah. That's that. And ITBM is also based on gradient boosting? Sorry? Like GBM? Like GBM is exactly, uh, yeah, it's it's still yeah, cool. exactly, yeah. Yeah, sure. if, if you were to make a graph with depth with respect to time, would that yeah. also be exponential? Um, yeah, so basically, because you have like a number of three, which are a lot, right? Yeah. And because each depth is increasing by two, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the number of uh, nodes you have, right. then the, because we are doing Matrix multiplications now, and not no more tree products. The matrix, the matrices increase on both sides. Right? Yeah, there's no pruning that you can do that in the search. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, basically, the matrices are full of zeros, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, they are big. And zeros in FHE is as only a random number. Uh, okay, linear models. So, okay. so on the tree, you can't yeah. use the shape in any sense to know that there are zeros, as opposed to the data. Shape. I'm just wondering if, if the zeros are coming from the data or coming from the shape of the tree. Yeah, they are coming from. You are actually right. Those are uh, clear values. Yeah. yeah, there are clear values on this. So you could use sparse probabilities rather than yes. Yes. Well, yes. yeah. Yes. It's just okay. we need to use sparse. Oh, now we our compiler yeah. doesn't use any sparse speed uh, improvement. Okay. But yes, at some point uh, okay. we should be using that. Okay. Yes. Yeah, sparse matrix multiplication in FHE would be really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That that's, makes it sound like it's. I, I, I mean, sparse matrix multiplication is basically uh, very trendy, even in machine learning in general. Oh, yeah. Because mm -hmm. you know, you've got mm -hmm. tons of zeros everywhere. Um, yeah, okay. Deep learning. So why is this uh, slightly more complicated than two previous models I showed? Well, first, uh, well, considering the size of the current machine learning models, you can imagine running them in FHE is quite a challenge, but uh, it's doable. And let's look at uh, the challenges here. So if you take like the most simple part of neural nets, it's basically down to a single neural, right? Uh, where um, a neuron is basically, you take all the inputs attached to this neuron, you multiply that by all the weights uh, accordingly to, to, to the connection, and then you sum everything uh, into Y, which is now an accumulator. So the problem is, if you have tons of connections and you have quantized your inputs and your weights over two, two bits or three bits, then even though you have low precision here, this Y here is going to increase quite a lot. And more connection means higher, potentially higher uh, Y given. So fortunately, there is another trend in machine learning uh, which will help us here, is the pruning. So basically people realize that training machine learning models within some parameters uh, generalize quite well, but at inference time, uh, we don't need these buildings of parameters. Uh, they actually, like more than 90% of those weights that have been learned are useless for the accuracy of the model. 
uh, which are it's quite surprising but very interesting because now you can just delete entire uh, neurons and, and, and ease a lot the, the complications. And this will help us because now we're gonna prune the model quite a lot, which will reduce the, the, the accurate of all this uh, work here. Yeah, but in, in general, a lot of them are zero, but aren't some neurons still have a lot of connections? Yeah, they have a lot of connections, but if 90% no, of- No, no, them, I said some of them have weight, have a lot of connections that have um, weights that matter. Yeah. Many of them have one or yeah. two, but yeah. there will be some yeah. that will have a lot of significant input. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so we, then, we can. Then, you, then yeah. you have the overflow problem. Well, it, the way we are pruning it is is uh, basically saying we don't want more than what well, we, we okay. can compute the maximum number, theoretical number okay. of activated weights uh, different than zero, such that you don't overflow. Okay, because normally you would just base it on the value. Yeah, exactly. Of the normally yeah. you would just take the importance into account the time right, of the weights yeah. and then cut them. Um, you can actually do the pruning during training such that when you cut uh, connections that are potentially more important than others, then, uh, the model can basically uh, retrain, relearn what, what we cut. And you still get the same accuracy. And we, you still get the same accuracy. It's, it's not obvious. Yeah, it's, it's just distributed over in the network. Um, and yeah, so, so yeah, there is quantization pruning. And then uh, basically, when y is in a, a decent range, so basically from one bits to 16 bits, you just uh, apply the PVS, so the f of y could be a uh, well, whatever. Out. And then this is acceptable. Uh, uh, so, yeah, sure. so well, machine one. learning, there is two ways to basically sure. do the sure. where you pre train the model and then you apply. Uh, roughly, uh, uh, all the weights and the parameters uh, into the integer ball. And the other way is basically um, while you try and while you fine tune your model, you show that the model is being quantized. That way, when you back propagate, when you update all the parameters, then the updates take into account the quantization. So you converge, so your model converge to much better solution. Quantized solution. So here, just a, a visualization again. So you have in the middle the floating points uh, neural network, and here on the right you have the complete ML neural net uh, built in, which basically you, you can just start with uh, like uh, uh, two lines of code. And here you can see that there are come some uh, the quantization artifacts are more present here because we had because of this accumulation we had to reduce. Um, the number of bits in the inputs and in the weights, and also do some pruning. So you can see the other steps from quantization. So it, the, the accuracy is pretty similar, but sometimes there are some jumps uh, where you lose. Right, you, you, you do, because you have so um, low number of precision, if you miss by a single value, sometimes you can crack the, the accuracy, right? So there is a white paper on this uh, to explain how we basically build them all these PBSs and, and, and fuse them together. Uh, you can check it out. What were those percentages accuracy numbers? On the on the bottom right, yeah, it's the accuracy number. Oh wait, it increased in the last case. Yeah. So there is a yeah. funny thing coming with quantization, uh, which we did not want at first, right. but it happens. It's basically help. It's regularizing the model because you are quantizing. Okay. You are the model cannot overfit as much really, as it yeah. could before. And suddenly we have some kind of, yeah, but it's, it's not something we wanted to do, but sometimes it's like it happens. Now, do you adjust the tables to account for the discretization effects or just their straight calculation? Yeah. Uh, discretization, you mean quantity? Yeah. In the, in, the, in the PBS tables. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You could adjust for the known quantizations that were going to happen. So if the exact value would say it's this value, yeah. you know because of quantization, we'll get a better result. Yeah, yeah. Make it slightly different. Can you do that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. We okay. do this. Yeah. We, yeah, we quantize, we put everything in integer 
and 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 they will look at that screen. Is exactly what Stanford Security 的一个那个会议在讲说，做 AI 的时候，可以先把 data encrypt 了之后做 AI。你会觉得 AI 不是要做很多运算吗？ Know, 你不知知道原来的 data。他说，你可以把 data encrypt 之后，它还能做 AI，、mm-hmm. 就是说它不需要看你原始。那这样的话， one interesting topic is like actually learning this table. That way, right? Um, the quantization of a training, I guess, in some way, is sort of learning the table. Yeah, sense, right? yeah, it, it's like, some, yeah, yeah, exactly.、Uh, yeah, but sometimes maybe the table, you know, when you're on the border, like you can, you could quantize one way or another.、Uh, we don't account for, for this kind of mistake. And if you have a lot of, you don't know where to go, then you could make some loss in your course. But the 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 training that you do now is. Full floating point, or you train with quantization? Yeah. So the the full training is at inference time we quantize everything. And the training time? At, at training time, yeah. So you in you do the inference, right? Everything is quantized. You do the inference, and then you get get some, right? You can compute all the gradients. Yeah. The gradients you apply them to the floating points. So you keep the fourteen points in the model, oh, yes, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. And at each inference, you basically apply quantization, and you show, okay, you're going to be quantized like that. Adapt your weights.、Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. And the final thing is, well, if you are feeling、uh, well with、uh, the torch or testosterone、uh, libraries, then of course you can build your own neural net.、Uh, so we are friendly with.、Uh, Library called Brevitas, which does quantization of training. It's basically just、uh, specific uh, layers uh, that allow this quantization of training. You just set a number of bits, and then every inference,、uh, everything is quantized with the number of bits you, you, you put there. And when you backpropagate,、uh, there is some tricks such that you update the floating points, and then you can go out.、Mm-hmm. Right.、Uh, so once you have done this, you can, and you have your model ready. Now there is nothing、uh, that should change from this model that you built、uh, to the FHE model. You can just call the function, put your torch model there,、uh, some inputs to represent all the boundaries in the model in terms of precision, and then you get、uh, the, the FHE model. Good.、Um, yeah. So the development process for different models, essentially, you just or、well, you can train the model、uh, yourself with quantization and weight training, but you could also just Take、uh, a pre-trained model on the internet.、Uh, so we have a, like a, we have an example of this in the repo.、Uh, basically, we pull a model that does well on ImageNet, and we fine-tune it with quantization and training on another task. And and in the end, you get your final model、uh, that runs in FHE. You can do simulation. Simulation is very important because yeah,、uh, once you want to、uh, check the accuracy of your model over lots of data points,、uh, you better do it in the simulation. And then you can basically split all the clients and stuff, and just go to the final. And what is a question、yeah. from Isaac? Sorry,、uh, says, may I know if the input data is also quantized during inferencing? The input data is always quantized.、Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In FHE, the input data is always quantized.、Uh, yeah. yeah, but this is done in the client. Right. We have some pre-processing. Basically, we take the floating points from the user and transfer them to Integer. Actually, it's done before the、yeah. encryption. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The encryption yeah, yeah. is done over Integer, so it must happen on the client、yeah. side. So, so how does the performance scale? Is the number of bits if I went from eight to sixteen and then sixteen to thirty-two?、Yeah. How would it scale? The performance or yeah, the or, yeah the runtime of a given inference. Yeah. So it it increases quite a lot. Uh, especially、uh, when exponential. Yeah, I'm not sure about this. It depends on the model because we will have models that、uh, basically you cannot distribute them completely, right?、Mm-hmm. So, yeah. What we see is that if you are under、uh, these seven bits of precision max in the whole circuit, then 
it's it's very it's kind of stable, right? But then it goes it, it decreases quite uh, quite exponentially. Okay. Um, yeah. So you want the lowest bit as possible. Yep. Okay. Um, so back for the last uh, few slides. Um, so how does it work? Um, <laughs> Oops. Uh, so how does it work under the hood? Uh, so in the uh, so in the company we are make, making few uh, tools. So we we have uh, mainly spoken about concrete ML, but actually concrete ML is just one thing, and it's built on the uh, another uh, big thing, which is the concrete. So concrete is more or less uh, two things. So it, let's start with the compiler. So it's a compiler made with MLIR. Uh, so maybe you know what MLIR is, or if you know what LLVM is, it's about the same thing. So there, they are turning uh, some uh, program into the FHE equivalent uh, with uh, some steps. Uh, I don't know the details, but if, maybe if you have questions, questions Pascal will answer them. Then there is uh, an optimizer. So here, uh, they give uh, the program to this optimizer, which is responsible of finding the best uh, crypto parameters. So they are going to search uh, in the possible parameters, only the ones which are secure. So the more, uh, they, you know, they ask uh, the lattice, uh, lattice estimator to know what are the possible uh, secure parameters. And there, with some uh, estimation of the cost, I mean, execution time cost, uh, they, they take the best uh, choices. Um, so that's the compiler, uh, but uh, as a human, you don't want to ask to, to speak to the compiler. So you have a front end. So currently, we have a single front end, uh, which is a concrete Python. So here, you, you write your uh, Python program, and it, it's compiled to FHE. And concrete Python it, it is actually what we are using in concrete ML. So concrete ML, we we place your model, we quantize it, we create a function in NumPy, and then we let the hard work uh, done by a uh, concrete uh, so, so your examples all showed simply calling functions, not doing computation between the calls, but uh, presumably I can write an arbitrary Python. Yes, yes, yeah. in concrete Python, yeah. you can write. Yeah. So there, just are, see that the example. there are still some limits. Yeah. So integers, for example, mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, univariate functions, uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. But yes, you could more or less write anything you want. And notably, also one thing that we will do at some, at some point at uh, Zama is a collaborative uh, computation, where you have a function which is, uh, you know, uh, with uh, some inputs which comes from different uh, entities that don't want to share the data. Mm -hmm. So we will write this with in Python and uh, compile it to FHE. And uh, one, one quick question: I don't see a debugger. Debug? Yeah, what are you doing for debug? So yes. So when you have a bug, <laughs> well, it's, it's not that often, but what so a bug, for example, <laughs> might be, might be, but I don't know if it is a bug, but if you take too many, you are too optimistic, too optimistic, you take too many bits, and then at the at the end the model it takes too many. I mean it says it is going to break and tells you, tell you this step has uh, 23 bits, which yeah. is uh, more than 16 bits to do something. Yeah, no, no, my bug is normally I put plus when I should put minus. Yeah, but no, I use a debugger to find those things, you know, single step to look at values. Uh, so there is simulation yeah. which may help you. Okay. Uh, no, no, you you certainly work. don't want to debug things in FHE. No. <laughs> uh, simulation is normally very equivalent. So it does the same computation, but over and that could be uh, right. without the you so know the so debugging uh, that. No. Yes, but, but you mean debugging the output of the computation? No, I meant or just debugging the compiler. Oh, but, but no, no, I meant debugging the, the Python. Function. Oh, but, but then you debug it as a, as you debug a Python. That's normally. what I want to know. Yes, yeah. you, so yes. You, you write your Python, you make it work, so it's your work, and then you can turn it into a Okay, got it. Yes, yes. that's that's what's um, yeah. so, that, what. Yeah. What how do you debug the compiler? Uh, debugging the compiler is, yeah, you know, yeah. it's an adventure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. We really, so, really so, wanted to do things well, but we go we turn to formal methods and try to prove the compiler. Correct. So what, what you do but if you have not even close. <laughs> <laughs> well, most of it. So what you do, do if ever you have a bug in, uh, in in something in some product that we have compiled our computer right? just go to our uh, support. Uh, so we have a support uh, uh, forum. Where you can ask your questions like Stack Overflow. You also have a Discord, 
uh, where you can uh, ask your questions, but also discuss with uh, other people who are working on the um, So yeah, you ask and we're going to help you uh, for free. Um, <laughs> um, then, so at the end of the compiler, so it creates the client parameters, uh, which contains in the crypto parameters. So if you are a cryptographer and you want to check what Zama is, uh, pretends to be secure, yes, you can. You just have a look there. Uh, you check with the lattice, lattice estimator and uh, you see that it looks fine. And then the compile, compile function uh, at, comp, uh, at runtime uh, is going to use the backend. Uh, so for now, we are mainly about CPU backend, which explains a bit uh, why we are um, sometimes slow. Uh, but we are also working with. Uh, uh, so either internally uh, in the company or also outside with uh, some uh, uh, big companies to have uh, hardware accelerators. Uh, so GPU is something which is going to come very soon. Uh, then FPGA, uh, so it's a bit longer. And then ASICs, so we will have a lot of uh, improvement uh, speed up by this, but it takes uh, years to, to have it. So, and it's not done internally. I mean, it's a big project, so it's uh, other companies. Yeah. Yes, you expect like that's a significant speed up, right? Like, oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So, so if you were at uh, the RSA Innovation Contest, <laughs> so Pascal uh, said that every year, every year, we multiply the performance by four. Every every couple of years, oh, couple there of is years. like a four x improvement. And but what we need right now with our acceleration is closer to three to four orders of magnitude. Uh, and uh, KUL, so people in London are actually working in a great and good this group. They're actually building, uh, I mean, there are several teams and several projects part of it. They kind of stuff. There's like a DARPA project with Intel, with Galway, with other people building some hardware. Uh, but they're right now, they are like six, seven different groups of people that are actually building hardware acceleration for FG. And KUL, so they uh, in Japan, so a couple of uh, weeks. When was it? Weeks. One month ago. Yes. Yeah. You were there, right? I think I remember. Yeah. From, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so the, the guy from Leuven, uh, yes. he actually did the presentation. It was awesome. Yes. And they, they have like a, a factor, a speed up of 4,000. Oh. Yeah. And they're, they're, in FPGA. They, they hope with an FPGA. Wow. Which means the day you go to the all the way to the ASEC, it's, it's even better because you consume less power. You, you, know, you benefit from really doing like a, an ASEC. Um, but it, it's so it, it means that we're very close. We predict like by 2025. Actually, there is some smack, so maybe it will happen sooner, 2024, like next year. That actually we have our acceleration, and then it means you can have like a homomorphic equivalent of what you do. And the worst that you would lose is like a factor between one X and ten X, <laughs> which means the crypto, but with hardware acceleration yeah. compared to non-accelerated by index operations. But it, it means that the crypto is not a bottleneck anymore. Because like, it's at one could become faster. Yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. In some cases, actually, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is amazing. And there's a cap, but, and there's a cap. But, but it means that at some point there is. <laughs> <no> <laughs> There is no point not doing things encrypted by default because it doesn't change the user experience. And actually, you will have to explain why you actually you care about the data <laughs> you handle here, which will become suspicious. Like, uh, so we're coming very fast to that very exciting moment in time where everything will be fast enough to become more efficient execution to support like uh, you know, eighty percent of. AI applications, cloud applications, whatever applications, which is nice. Yeah. Well, smart, you know, smart contracts have shown that people will put up with a one million dollar factor slow down. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> so that, that's why we're also like working on a blockchain mm -hmm. side of things um, because we think right now people are not afraid of like integrating like advanced crypto stuff. They actually very often read the papers on their own <laughs> and overnight, like they block something and some yeah. GitHub, like uh, after three days or something. So they don't, they're not afraid of adopting like super advanced, like uh, almost still like uh, stuff that is still in, like being researched 
and they, there's a huge appetite for blockchain or for uh, everything that has to do with encrypted uh, communications. Well, that sensitivity to new stuff depends on the value of the smart contract. Yeah, exactly. They're very conservative for the big ones. So we're so we're this year we are actually launching a testnet uh, where you, you will be able. So what we did is we we took the Ethereum virtual machine, we made a FHE version of it. And so nothing to do with this presentation, by the way, this is really uh, ML oriented, but we have another team working on this where we are exposing solidity like uh, constructs that are very easy to use, where you can annotate, you have basically a, a type of annotation where for the developer who's developing the smart contract, so this and these variables are encrypted, and the state of the smart contract, because it's a state machine, uh, can be encrypted as well. And um, this is where it becomes important to use the encryption technique that we're using because we have like super fast bootstrapping. One bootstrapping is like a few milliseconds uh, compared to the other like crypto solutions where bootstrapping takes like 10 seconds or something. Well, it always depends on parameters. But, and so it means you can you can actually, um, we actually run already transamorphically uh, secure, homomorphically encrypted transactions over Ethereum earlier this year. Unfortunately, so the historical moment yeah. happened, yeah. 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 but it's still like being like it's in the works. Like it's, unfortunately, Solidity is not a secure programming language. A company of Goric, a company Goric has one, and so you might want to okay. look at them. Goric, okay. Go Agoric. Agoric. Oh, Agoric. Okay, they have a, okay. a secure yeah, language on top. Any anyway, different topic? Yeah. Okay, back anyway, to. Yeah, back. Um, yes. Um, so yes, if you want to, to try this, uh, I recommend you to have a look to to, to to clone our repo and just have a look to what we were able to do, and maybe you can do better. Uh, so there are the, the, the demos that there are that, that we we have put in a, in a hugging face so image filtering and sentiment analysis where we take a short message which is encrypted. And we tell you if it is a positive or negative message. Um, yes, yeah, so, so obviously we have a missed uh, classification. Uh, so here it's done with uh, the easy uh, neural network, so the built-in neural network that we have in concrete image. So there is just a few uh, parameters to uh, to set. Uh, we have also a version of Titanic. So here it's done with some three days. Uh, I don't know if it is random forest or edge loop, but you can see. And for the most advanced examples that we have, so we have some examples with Cypher, uh, so classifying some objects. So here it's done with um, with the complicated uh, deep learning stuff that uh, Jordan explained. So with the quantization aware training, so you can see how it works under the hood. Uh, but the team was able to uh, have very good results for Cypher, but but making it uh, in Vegas as small as possible. So we, at the end, we have uh, we have results like that. Um, so yeah, 97 percent for NIST, which is not state of the art, but it's quite good in FHE. So at the end, you have uh, 12 bits of precision for the integers. Um, then we have uh, Cypher 10 and uh, 100, uh, where the accuracy is also quite uh, good. Uh, so it, more or less, it's uh, equivalent to VGG, a kind of models. Which were state of the art uh, not a long time ago. Um, so here it's like 13 or 14 bits of precision. Uh, so today, with what is publicly available, so it's hours of computation just for single inference. But there, there is something backing in the team which are we, we are going to release also, which we, we make uh, things much faster. More or less, we when we have the big accumulator, we just take the few first bits. Of this, and uh, so we approximate, we remove the bit of uh, the end, which allows us to, instead of having PBS of uh, 13 bits, we can maybe have PBS of uh, six bits. So obviously, you are, you are going to have a computation which are related to the speed of uh, a six bit PBS. Then, so, with that, how, how long does it usually have to run? So, it, it will be uh, so far as the Cypher 10, it will be, so our estimation, because we haven't been able to run it. Is, is that it's going to be like 22 times faster, which translates to about what? So it's uh, so it's uh, 20 something minutes. 20 minutes. 
other the inference here. Uh, so, which is uh, still uh, not very practical, so we are still waiting for the other solutions. Yes. Yeah. Everything will come into place with our exploration, right. essentially because in machine learning, you can do all these layers, if you have like okay. infinite parallelism, yeah. and it takes just a few milliseconds to run this wrapping. Well, you could do, and, and because you're bootstrapping, so the ciphertext are clean, are always clean, so you can go as deep as you want. Yeah. And it only depends on the number of layers, not the number of neurons, with infinite value, which is which never happens when you do your architecture. So actually, at the end, in the, so in the company, we are trying to improve the speed by, uh, at the different levels. So ML team is uh, uh, using less speed for the quantization. Uh, compiler is uh, making things more efficient. And then we will have uh, the hardware acceleration, which, which are going to make the speed uh, Pretty fast. Um, obviously, so we have to speak about <laughs> LLM. Uh, so what what do we say about LLM and FHE? So you've read the news. Uh, if you you were asking a chat GPT, you were sent in the clear, and uh, it was very bad for your privacy. So we plan to work on this in uh, in Zama. Uh, so we just made some estimations. So. That would be like one billion of PBS for an LLM, which is a lot. Um, so we, we have uh, given some uh, numbers. So it's uh, five thousand dollars per token, uh, which is a lot. Uh, so we expect we, we we need to have things much faster. But still, we will work on it uh, this quarter in the team, and and so we will work on it at toy scale. So we just show that it's possible to do it. Uh, more or less, and just uh, then we will say we wait uh, for the hardware accelerators and it yeah. will be doable. Just for the fun of it. Yeah, and, and how much memory do these things? Uh, uh, don't you see? Well, um, I don't know for the, the real ones uh, because we don't even know what they not are. The one, not the yellow ones, but the, the previous ones. Yeah, so for example, the, the oh. cipher and the biggest thing that we built. Yeah. It took like 11 gigabytes of RAM. Okay, good. Uh, it's, it's about one. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, uh, what we say, we, we really run, uh, run them. So, yes, it works. And it on my phone. Uh, yeah. I don't know if it works on your phone, but it's, it's not supposed to work on your phone. Yeah. It's for uh, <laughs> next, the next model. Yeah. Uh, also, yes, one thing. So, the team has mainly worked on the accuracy to make things as good as they are in the with floats. Uh, then we will work on speed. So I told you that we're going to be like 25 uh, times faster. Then we will work on we will work on making things more efficient, like smaller keys, less RAM, and things like that. So we know some techniques uh, to compress ciphertext or the RAM and so on. It's just that we have to focus on something for the moment. Okay. Uh, if you are interested uh, in uh, in uh, reading, uh, so Rand wrote a blog, a blog about the uh, LLM yeah. Yeah. and uh, we we tell you what. Uh, so in three months, uh, as you will follow the the company, uh, you will see what we have been done, uh, uh, been able to do at uh, at least. Um So thanks a lot for your time. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this and you learned a few things. So what would be Crazy for me, great for us is that you download this and you try it by yourself. So you can try to reproduce uh, the, the few examples that we have. And then, even better for us, you can try to build your own uh, examples. Mm -hmm. uh, we've said that it's uh, open source, uh, I mean, for our research. So do whatever you want and show it to the world. And uh, you can go on the, you know, we set the support channel. So if ever you are able to make, a, if you are able to beat us on, uh, on the sci-fi, great for you. Mm -hmm. So also tell it to the world and, yeah. and fine. I mean, uh, we'll tell you a great. Mm -hmm. And we'll send you another card. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, so that's it for us, I think. Uh, GitHub, uh, so you can also uh, hit star. I mean, uh, just uh, some star over there. <laughs> And uh, yes, that's it. I don't know if there are questions. Let's thank the speaker. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's one question already. So they're saying, like, in the home of a domain, can we have an argmax function? This is from Isaac Young. Uh, 
Um, yes. Max, yes, it is doable with the matrix uh, things. So it's a bit like, uh, you know, for the trees. Uh, so more or less, you, you compute the max. And then with matrix, we are going to, to compare where the max is. A, it's going to be low, not as efficient as it is in the, but it's doable, yes. I think there are several approaches to actually compute an arc max homomorphically. Um, but for GPG, there is one, but we're, to my knowledge, we're not using right now, are we? And not in concrete ML, not in concrete maybe no. in concrete yeah. Uh, Python. Yeah. Uh, it's um, when we are asked that kind of things uh, by yeah. the users, we tell them how to do it, but uh, I wouldn't say it's baked in the product for now. Yeah, sure. Um, if the mass library for the blockchain development required this at some point, but so it's in the works. But every, I mean, for all the schemes like CKKS, I think there are like a specific solution that, that works well for CKKS. Okay. So, but uh, yeah. yeah, the answer is yes, you, you can do that. Yeah. Uh, other questions? No. no. Yes. Um. Just just thinking through the the hardware example, you 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 mentioned about acceleration. I kind of wanted to just like conceptually, we're at like one millisecond for PBS. Let's say, like in an optimistic scenario, it's like one millisecond for every mm -hmm. bootstrapping operation. Mm -hmm. Is is the way you would think about acceleration that like eventually we get to a, I guess uh, one two one thousand x kind of increases where uh, a single PBS is like a nanosecond, like a, like a cycle in the CPU. And then it seems reasonable to say that you could you could be only 2x worse than like a, a plain text CPU because like each operation you're doing, you, you, you do the normal plain text operation and then you have to do it with PBS. But I guess what I'm trying to ask is like getting to within, you know, one to 10x of like plain text speed, won't you just on the chip that you're making you have to dedicate a lot of die areas to doing the PBSs because those are expensive, right? Like mm -hmm. each each PBS, do you have to do after each block? And, and if so, then like, how are you going to get to a one to ten x? So, <clears throat> so there are ten ten two things to unpack. <laughs> so the first thing is, so it's not like one millisecond, but it's closer to like six milliseconds yeah. on a CPU or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but just as an order of uh, you know. To have a, an idea of what costs a TPU to be. Of course, it depends on the parameters and everything, and the parameters to kind of parts of a circuit that you're evaluating more quickly. And the compiler is actually finding the parameters back on the fly, depending on you know, trying to optimize the whole circuit under constraints. So it, it really depends. But like um, if you have like to remember one one figure, it would be like this like six milliseconds ish for, for one PBS, or just like one Boolean gate. Elementary or more pro version. When it comes to the hardware, um, so we have a few people internally who actually work on FPG design, but, but we're not expecting people from the company to to go all the way. Like where it's just like for yeah. just research. Like it, so, we're partnering with people where their own they have like different strategies how to implement the BDS. Uh, so there are companies like Konami, Apalisis. So they all have their own angle at this. Mm -hmm. They're, they're oh. trying like different things. Like Optalysis is about because the uh, essentially the, the the bootstrapping operations you need for that you need to implement either an NTT or an FFT. Yeah, it's mostly NTTs right it, now. Right? It's, it's like eighty percent NTTs. It, yeah, at yeah. six milliseconds. Exactly. It's like right. Four the, milliseconds. The bottleneck is doing FFTs like the just thing. like first time. And so without the schemes, you don't have a choice. You actually have to use NTT. So it's a little bit more you know, cumbersome from a, a conventional point of view. But with the FFT, with, with TFHT, we can use the FFT. I mean, the signal theoretic FFT. So there can be noise in there, uh, noise in the sense of approximation errors. It's fine. Mm -hmm. So you can actually like use like fixed, uh, fixed point uh, numbers and do an FFT with that. And I mean, FFT is been known in other work for like 50 years. How big, uh, how big are these FFT? I'm sorry? How big are these FFT? Our big, uh, typically, oh. I would say the typical size of the, the input vector is like 10, 24 coefficients, 10, 10. <coughs> which is and nothing. They're all, they're all 1D. They're all 1D. One 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 yes. yes. Uh, I think there is an extension of the PBS where you can do things that are 2D. Uh, but um, 
yeah, essentially for uh, at least this first like wave of hardware accelerators, one D like yeah, we, we don't need more of that. Like, and so that's why we're so optimistic about the mass adoption is because the only thing that is missing right now, we don't have to improve things at the crypto level anymore. Mm -hmm. Things at the engineering level, yes, like providing better compilation, you know, uh, being able to synthesize circuits to guarantee like optimal topological transformation from the plain text algorithm coming from the user to the to the actual homomorphic uh, circuit. Uh, but when it comes to the acceleration, we see that, yeah, I mean, at some point, if you could just like put a lot of uh, FFTs, you know, mod FFT modules in there, mm -hmm. and just boost everything. And, 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 and this is typically what is, what is happening right now. Yeah. Uh, it's only that people have like different ways of looking at this. And, uh, so optalysis is doing things optically. So well, they have like mm -hmm. optoelectronics because you can do FFTs uh, <laughs> with optics like very, very efficiently. The problem is you don't have just, if you had just an FFT, you don't know, <laughs> Actually, you have to switch to it. It's still bang. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Do some stuff there, essentially multiply uh, an, an encrypted accumulator by a part of the public key. And then go back to the standard domain, do some kind of truncation or whatever, which we don't know how to do in the domain. And then mm -hmm. go back. And so you spend your entire time in the PBS just mm -hmm. switching back and forth between the standard domain and the FFT domain. And by the way, if we had a solution to do everything in the domain, that would be fantastic <laughs> because we yeah. our acceleration would be minimized, which is out of this world. But in the meantime, we don't know how to solve that kind of problem. So you just have so it's not only about doing the 50 conversions and everything, but you also have a little bit of logic that you need, and that you can do quickly. So you need to have like a some kind of a hard hybrid thing. And there are other companies like Economy, they, they have like a way of, uh, of uh, it's kind of, I don't know to describe that, it's kind of a data flow computation where everything is like, uh, uh, what's the name of this? Streaming? Uh, uh, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of streaming, yes, exactly. So you can kind of stream, have a, have a stream of computations, like having a, some kind of an avalanche effect depending on the availability of what you're computing. At, at some point, but you can you can basically, yeah, they, they show that they have like a, a very interesting. Uh, it's not typical to FHG. You, you can program the other mm -hmm. hardware that you can like, uh, accommodate with any kind of computation. But I, I guess the nearest question was uh, that's it's really fascinating in that you could imagine the x86 changing with you know, the, <laughs> the PBS instruction. Like, yeah, 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 yeah
crypto, I mean, the crypto was what it was in terms of performance and everything on a single CPU, but there was a lot going on with uh, memory management, like things, objects in cache and stuff that you don't see when you operate on top of a crypto library as a virtual machine. But they, you, you lose a lot of time from that thing. And if you, if you actually compile all the way to the target code, you can integrate orchestration, you know, um, scheduling and stuff. You can take, and there are in, already like you can, you can resort to an LVM to do that. There's an entire like ecosystem of, of, of ingredients and tools that you can reuse. So that's what our compiler does. It goes back to an LVM after doing all these transformations. And actually relies on the back ends provided by our So you have, you have good you have good looks, good locality to take yeah, use of that. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And so because it wasn't I mean making the crypto as, as efficient as you can is, is always good, of course. But it's not good enough. No, you have to take care of so many yeah. stuff when you actually deploy it. But it's how it be good. Yes. And it has nothing to do with the crypto, but you yeah. need to have some control over that to optimize the stuff. And so it's, it's like, so the virtual machine approach is pretty sexy because it could make it like easy to work with, inter interoperable. People would have like a kind of a standard format. So they could like handcraft programs, like do, you know, uh, write down programs like by hand or something, or even their own compiler. All the compilers would be, you know, interoperable. We were thinking of using WASM as like a universal mm -hmm. language to mix both. Um, of code instructions running like normally like in the fear uh, with up with up code homomorphic of code like to extend like and work on encrypted values but have some kind of representation of the memory and, and, and uh, the instruction set that was like uh, superposable to wasm and directly mm -hmm. but in the end we know that it's not going to be uh, efficient enough if we go that route mm -hmm. Yeah, but you get your whole user interface for free. But you, exactly. So that's why it's it's in the works. I mean, this is exactly the kind of that we that we have in Zamas like leadership of discussing. Okay, but, but because not nobody is using this like for real right now. Nothing is real. Uh, so things are in the pipe. They're in the works. But it's not there yet. So maybe in the end people will prefer the VM approach. But we don't know. Uh, you know, it takes a village. It's good that you know there is there is room for everybody right now. Like we need more and more contributors, we need ideas, we need the dance, we need demos, we need initiatives, we need the community. You, you said something interesting that uh, you, you're you're did I hear this right? That you think you think that basically the the crypto construction for FEG kind of converged CFEG. And now it's kind of mostly engineering, or do you think there are still room for breakthroughs in FHE construction? There, there is room for breakthroughs, but uh, uh, by the way, this is like my opinion. Yeah. But <laughs> it's not everybody's opinion. Like it depends who you ask. Like um, yeah, what's your opinion? People, even even in the crypto community, I think CKKS is like more popular than TFHE. TFHE was like always looked at as like kind of the underdog. Another scheme it was there is a common misunderstanding, which is oh TFG, but it's, it's just like for Boolean circuits, which is not the case. You can you can process like small integers. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, but but to me, like because of this more effective lookup capacity, and because you, you can pretty much decompose like any big multivariate like function into a network of uh, Basically, lookup tables, univariate functions, and linear operations uh, can basically apply that transformation to anything. Right? It's like uh, there's these reconstruction theorems and machine learning where we prove that any multivariate function you can decompose into uh, uh, a layer, a two layer, I guess, uh, oh, with one hidden, hidden layer, right? Homograph has a position theorem. We're still looking for a, a discrete version of that, by the way, uh, where you where everything is like discretized into integers, and you're allowed to use like uh, linear combinations, modulo something, and then look up tables, and you're supposed to reconstruct with your network like any 
like specified big multivariate function. Uh, is that something that is, yeah, yeah. But, but so in my vision, I think TFH is all we need. We don't need more. Even if there are breakthroughs on the crypto side, there will be breakthroughs on the crypto side. But even without the, these breakthroughs, with good engineering and hardware acceleration, there's a huge appetite right now for um, data protection. And people are realizing this now. I mean, it's always, it has always been the case, but now with the AI, have you heard that Italy is banning the use of chat? Yeah. <laughs> because of that, because there is no data isolation uh, between the service provider and the user. And so FHG can provide that. It's not the only thing they can provide. Yeah, that, that, that's that's, that's that. not the only problem they have with chat. That's not the only problem, <laughs> of course. But I think now that there's starting to be like a, a market openings or opportunities that are opening for, for this. Actually, you're, you're introducing a problem because right now they filter the requests so they won't answer certain questions. And if the questions yeah, are true. encrypted, yeah. they won't be able to do that. That's true. That's perfectly true. Also, they will not be able to take advantage of these input outputs coming from users to actually improve the model. Um, so you will have to use like a, a, a an instance. Unless you can train on encrypted data. Sorry? Unless you can train on encrypted data. Oh, we can train on encrypted data. It's just uh, it's just super inefficient right now. Yeah. So we rather like recommend people to use like MPC, iterative mm -hmm. learning or like other techniques right now. Because um, it's not efficient enough. But at some point, it will probably be. I don't know. But there are so many things I think we have ahead of us. We have like years of research and super interesting and scientific problems to crack, but also like good engineering to do. And uh, there's also this, this market that is emerging, but they're in that for the, yeah, for the business side of things, it's, it's harder to see what's going to The vision is everybody will use at some point of morphic encryption by default. Wow. That's, um, Even the mess that the, the world yeah, of yeah, wow. sure. like, the like, internet and the data related problems, like, even the um, immensity of the problem. Like, it's like, yeah. it's it just destroyed 17 business models. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> but people are not forced to use this. Yeah, no, no, I'm just saying. It's just, it would be nice when you use 